Oké, okay. welkom everyone hier in uh, Deventer today en uh, online. I think we're going to start. Uh, I want to welcome you at this Studium Generale program, uh, Russia and Europe. What does the future look like? Um, this program is made in collaboration with uh, the Minor History, the Minor Liberal Arts and Sciences, and also the Deventer Committee for International Human Rights Day. My name is Brit. Um, I am working with Studium Generale, and uh, I will be your moderator for today. I uh, do not only want to welcome you here with us in the room, but also uh, all the people who are uh, joining uh, through the live stream uh, online. And I got from my colleague that's around 60 people now online joining. So also a big welcome to you. Well, um, the goal of uh, today's uh, program is to explore scenarios for the future relationship between Russia and Europe. With a special focus on uh, geopolitics. I think it's an uh, important, uh, important topic um, because it's, uh, it's good to look uh, forward, to see what is ahead of us and also to uh, go beyond what we uh, read in the daily newspapers every now and then. Um, at the same time, uh, it's also very personal and a sensitive uh, topic, maybe for some uh, people here also in the room today. Uh, and I think it's important that we um, uh, together uh, agree on that um, in our conversations today, that we uh, take into account and respect each other's various identities, uh, backgrounds, uh, nationalities, um, and also uh, lived experiences and traumas that uh, might be brought into this room. So I think it's important to, uh, to say that beforehand. Um, also, um, we have now this program here together. Um, but we already want to invite you for uh, the after talk, also because it's a sensitive topic. We think it's important that you have the opportunity to discuss afterwards what we discuss here today in, uh, in this program. So with a cup of tea and a snack, we invite you to, to join us uh, in the bakery at the end of the program. Okay, um, we don't only want you to join afterwards, we also want you to join during this program. And uh, I have this uh, microphone, I, I will walk uh, through the audience and, and ask for your input. But you don't have to, uh, to wait for that. You can uh, simply here in the room raise your hand if you have a question or a comment at any given time. And for uh, the people joining online, um, Saskia, my colleague, she is, uh, joining she is uh, also joining the, the chat. And you can post your question there. And um, yeah, she will just give us a hand or I will check in with Saskia to see if there are any questions coming in from there. Also, if you uh, would like to ask a question uh, anonymously, that's also possible. There is this uh, phone number there and uh, then uh, Saskia will pick it up from there. Okay, I think um, that's enough on a practical note for today. Let's get really started. And um, for that, uh, I want to introduce you to our first uh, guest speaker of today, uh, Hans van Koningsbrugge. He is a uh, professor of history and politics of Russia, and he's also uh, the director of the Netherlands Russia Center. Can you give me a warm applause for Hans van Koningsbrugge? <laughs> Hans, welcome. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, um, welcome Hans. And um, this might sound a bit as a contradiction because we're going to talk about uh, the future. Yes. You are a historian. Yes. Um, what what uh, can uh, history teach us about the future? Well, if you don't know the history, then you don't know the future. You need to have a knowledge about the history of people, of countries like Russia. And if you don't have that knowledge, then you're only bubbling about the future. Okay. So, so we desperately need knowledge about the future of, of history, especially because Russia had a very different history uh, compared with the West. It was isolated from the West. And therefore, Russians in general look totally different to their history as we do. So there is a difference, and that's important. Okay. Thank you, Hans. So uh, we're going, uh, according to Hans, do more today than just uh, bubbling uh, about, uh, <laughs> uh, about the future. Um, how are we going to do that? Um, together with uh, Hans, we will look at uh, three possible scenarios for the future relationship between Europe and uh, Russia. And uh, we will uh, discuss uh, these different scenarios, but we also want your input on that. And uh, the first uh, scenario um, is about um, the geopolitical um, position of Russia. 
Um, and therefore, um, we would like um, our uh, RENS, or <laughs> the technical team, to open um, menti.com. And we will also want to ask you to do that. So if you have your phone with you, you can go to www.menti.com. You can then enter the code that is there on the screen. I will read it out loud, also for the people at home. 79753812. And then we have a question for you about how likely you think this first scenario is. So, the scenario. In the coming years, Russia will further isolate itself from Europe. Do you think this is very unlikely to happen? Do you think it's, it's maybe a, a bit likely? Do you think it's very likely to happen? One is very unlikely and ten is very, very likely. Okay, I will wait a bit now for people to uh, enter their answer. Seven point five is the average at the moment. Okay, fifty participants have given their input so far. And a seven. All right, let's continue. Can I see uh, hands from uh, someone in this room who think it's very unlikely to happen? that Russia will further isolate itself. Okay, um, I see a hand, I'm coming to you, that's okay. Why do you think it's very unlikely that Russia will further isolate itself from Europe in the coming years? Um, it's a hard question, but um, I'm Ukrainian and I very much trust in the Ukrainian army and uh, also support from the West. I, I do see like, a fairy tale scenario in the future that uh, the uh, current regime in, Lush in Russia collapse and uh, then uh, the civil society with our help or I don't know the world's help it's kind of going to be a better picture so thank you for that input can I also see hands for for uh, participants who think it's very likely to happen that uh, Russia will be even further isolated itself from uh, from Europe. I know you all participated. I do see a hand. I come to you. Yes, thank you. I am Russian, <laughs> and uh, I see the news, and every everything goes to for the isolation, as I see. So, uh, Russian authorities they plan to burn all bridges. And uh, unfortunately, I can't see any signs of collapse. Thank you for your input. Okay. Um, then uh, we have a guest speaker, so let's go to our, to our guest speaker, uh, Hans. Um, the outcome, 7.1. Yeah. Does this surprise you? Is this, is this in line with, with your thoughts about yeah. this uh, yeah, it is. scenario? Um, and perhaps uh, some of you, or all of you, saw the, um, the public appearance of P Putin yesterday. And in that appearance before television, um, he mentioned that the war will take some time. S in other words... Yeah, it might be a long process, a he long said. A long yeah. process, a long war. And that's so he is preparing the Russian people for a long war. Putin realizes himself that he can't lose that war. Then his regime will, fini will be finished. On the other hand, Zelensky can do no territorial concessions. So basically, that's a diplomatic stalemate. And in that st diplomatic stalemate, Ukraine has the support of the West. Okay. So um, it's totally clear that Russia will not, <laughs> will not come together with Europe in, in, the, in the coming two, three years. Okay. And um, if I then uh, ask you the question, mm. um, how do they look at the future in Russia? If we think about the political elite, I don't know if that's Putin or more than Putin, but well what, what is their view <coughs> on the future? Well, uh, political elite is... First, you have to understand there is not one elite in Russia. There are several groups and several factions. Um, uh, three or four years ago, uh, Putin started to reorgan reorganize uh, the uh, Russian elite. So he removed all his uh, old friends, and now there are only people called Siloviki. Uh, Siloviki are people belong to the s uh, secret services or the ministry or the army or that kind of uh, people. 
basically they are highly dependent on him and they only uh, will get rid of him if they have well if there's no ch other chance to, to survive but in this context if they uh, race against Putin they lose everything perhaps their life it's very risky yeah so I don't see that in the in the coming future okay and um, um, do you have any uh, idea on um, uh, Putin uh, started this war in, in Ukraine? Okay. And um, does a lot of, um, I think, a threatening uh, language he's spreading uh, to, to Europe, uh, to the West. Uh, the West is exactly. reacting with exactly. uh, financial sanctions, uh, wi with foreign policy that's changing. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what, what is uh, Putin's um, idea for, for how, how should Russia look like? What should be the geopolitical position of Russia? Well, all his all his goals failed. So he wanted Russia back as a major power, but he, uh, he he perhaps he doesn't realize. But Ukraine is lost for the Russian world. Br uh, uh, Brzezinski, who was a former advisor of the U.S. president, once said, "Russia and Ukraine—that's an empire." But what's Russia without Ukraine? Not an empire. So all the goals he had, uh, energy. Uh, superpower also negative now no uh, well diminishing influence in Ukraine in Ukraine there's now no, a pro-western government exactly what he didn't want how is it possible so that's that's political it's unbelievable so it's a disaster you it's say. a disaster and not only that if you are Putin and you are in a meeting with the Tajik president well Tajikistan is a country sorry with uh, the, the GDP of uh, Southern Limburg. And what is the GDP? Can you explain? Uh, Bruto national product. Uh, so, uh, a absolutely economical dwarf. And the president of Tajikistan let Putin wait for two hours in a meeting. Uh, Putin has that habit also, but then you see the tables have turned. The tables, the tables have of turned, influence you say. have turned. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And and what what other tables have turned? Because there are also um, uh, this um, uh, people saying uh, that, that Russia is turning more towards the east, huh? towards uh, China, yeah. uh, Iran, uh, India. But first, well, uh, coincidentally, uh, two months ago, I was at a lecture of a Chinese professor. He talked three hours about Chinese foreign policy. Three hours extremely boring but <laughs> one thing the name Russia was never mentioned Russia is almost a non-entity for China it's almost it's only delivering oil and gas and perhaps wood and uh, s some uh, some s uh, coal but that's it it's more or less a colonial yeah, okay. relation yeah. Yeah. yeah, and related to that, um, in uh, Europe, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, we, we often speak of, uh, of Russia being uh, a paria in the international community. That's true. I, is that the same for, oh, is that a European framing, or do you see that also with, ah. with the countries I just mentioned? Y the, the basic question should be, what real friends Russia have at the moment? Probably Belarus. Probably... Cuba, <laughs> probably Venezuela, but that's it. China is not a friend. China uh, thinks only about China. And they are very, uh, well, they do that very carefully and diplomatic and blah, blah, blah. But if they buy Russian oil, that's an example. They do want, a pr uh, well, uh, want, want that against very cheap prices. So a rabat of 40%. Okay, so that's, that's not a good position of for Russia? Of course not, of saying. course not. Right. They, uh, uh, not so long ago, I think it's five, six years ago, they um, made a gas deal. Beijing made a gas deal with M Moscow. And what uh, really happened was that uh, in that deal, th they ne negotiated for 15 years, China and Russia, for that deal. But now there is a gas deal, and that gas deal, the question is, is it profitable for Russia? Questionable. So. Okay. I think it's pretty clear, uh, you're you. going a few <laughs> here. Um, I'm going to, uh, to Saskia. Uh, are there any uh, questions or uh, comments from the live chat or WhatsApp? Uh, not yet, but maybe I can ask you a question. Yeah. Um, who, who in Europe, uh, I, I hear my toys, uh, is going to split the 
the elite in Russia, do you think? Or is, is there um, not a European country? The question was how, who in Europe is yeah. going to... Euro yeah. yeah, do you think? Yeah. Do you think? I don't Europe. think that Europe at this moment has any influence on the Russian elite. Not at all. Because um, it's not only a, a it's not only Ukraine versus Russia, but it's only also the Russian elite who chose for other values than the European ones. So it is a clash of values. Uh, what Putin makes clear is, we Russians don't want your Western liberal values. Okay. okay. So and not on uh, speaking terms, you're also saying. Yeah. 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 So th that's that's it's it's not only a, a question of Ukraine versus Russia. It's also a clash between what do you think a good society should look like? And that's not a question. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yep. Um, are there any questions uh, based on uh, this scenario for Hans at the moment from within the room? I see no hands raised. I see a hand, yeah, I c I'll come to you with the mic. I will hold it. I wonder how many elites or children of the elites are still in Russia. Is there any idea about that? A lot of yeah. them are in Russia, but practically according to some reports, uh, and we don't know if that's for sure, but according to these reports, practically nobody is serving in the army. So they no mobilization for the, the yes, political they elite? All no. They have all kind of exceptions, so when you have children or you are at school or blah, blah, blah. But, uh, well, the, the curious thing is, of course, that all this, this negativity towards the West in the Russian elite, what did they do? They sent their children to Western schools. <laughs> well, that's, that's of, co of course, typical. Yeah. Contradiction so in that that's sense. That's a contradiction, yeah. yes. Yeah. One last question before we go to the next scenario. Yep. Um, uh, you say it's, it's actually a disaster for Russia. I it was not planned this way. What was their plan? Oh, it, it, of course, the Russian state invested 15 billion dollars in organizing a smooth coup d'etat in Kiev. Coup d'etat? Yeah, in February. So um, this, this didn't happen. They thought in three days we will have Kiev and then everything will be arranged. But that what was, was their plan for entering Kiev in the first place? What, what would well, they, they, would they, uh, they would create a puppet regime, uh, but probably... Uh, uh, the same in, in uh, Belarus. Exactly, mean. exactly. Yeah. A, a, a kind of puppet regime under the direction of Yanukovych or another of Medvedchuk, uh, this Ukrainian oligarch who's now in Moscow. Probably some kind of... But the Secret Service told Putin, OK, when this army is coming, your, uh, the Russian army is coming, you will be in, uh, well, there will be a big celebration with balloons and everyone will be happy. You, you will be welcomed. You will, Th that you will be welcomed with flowers and balloons and, uh, well, it, uh, that's of course crazy, but okay. That, that was the story in okay. Moscow. Thank yeah. you. Um, we're going to the next scenario. Oh, I see a raised hand by Saskia. Go ahead. Yes, I, st I still have a question about the, the people in, the I I I people in the Russia. Mm -hmm. um, as a historian, w what is needed to, to get the people uh, uh, in the revolution uh, Near East uh, position? Oh, that's a very difficult question. Uh, I myself um, have, uh, well, we also have a, a center um, manned with Russian people in Russia. And if you talk about this, um, I always notice there's a lot of, well, uh, we will. We won't. Uh, we will not see this. We don't want to have to do anything with it. Uh, so, it's it's for them very difficult to see the truth. And if you, after 20 years of state propaganda, uh, of course you are brainwashed, and that's the problem. So if you say, if 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 if, if you think there will be a revolution, so I don't think so because this propaganda is very strong and this, this uh, thinking. And what's what is this thinking? Well, Russia is a very important, perhaps a superpower. 
we have in, in the 90s, uh, it was a disaster, but now we are powerful again and we want to stay powerful and everyone has to recognize that. It's about recognition. So, when you look at the Russian history, when was there a revolution? That was always in times of hunger. For instance, 1917. After, uh, during the First World War, at, at a certain time, there was, it was difficult to simply to get food in St. Petersburg. And then there came an uprising, and that was the end of the Tsar. Well, if that happens, then you have a chance. Otherwise, you don't have, because don't forget, in Russia there is a Rosguardia, that's the private army of the president, of 400,000 men. 400,000 400, men, that's a lot. Men. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, for keeping <laughs> order. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the <coughs> next uh, scenario. And uh, then we're going to open uh, Menti again. So again, we're, we're asking for, uh, for your input from the audience. Um, this one is about uh, the European Union. And uh, until now, uh, we have seen that they um, uh, have acted in a quite uh, unanimous way towards Russia, kind of a, a unity that, uh, that uh, Europe formed. And uh, the question is, uh, will that stay the same in the coming months? And please enter your answer. Are we going towards the average seven again? No, <laughs> it's rapidly declining. It's declining indeed. Okay, uh, around uh, 50 participants uh, provided their answer so far. Um, again, uh, I would like to see hands. Um, who thinks this is a very unlikely scenario to happen? Who thinks this, this unity that, that the European Union has, has shown so far, it's, it's something that, uh, that will not continue? Okay, I see, I see a hand there. Please explain your, your view on that. Well, I'm a bit worried about... Um when fossil fuel will become a large problem, a big problem in, in our society. I don't, um, Mr. van Koningsbrug already mentioned uh, that it is a problem when uh, people are hungry, but also it will also become a problem when people um, do have to live in a, in a cold house. Yeah, very clear answer, thank you. Um, can we go back one more time to uh, the scenario? I would also would like to see hands um, who think, uh, well, uh, they, they are acting very strong, European Union. Uh, they've been never been so decisive. And I think that will stay in, in the coming months. Yes, Roel. Go ahead. Uh, I think that it will stay, not because, not on the fact itself, but on the way they will be, maybe have there will be a, a dispute on the way they are going to deal with Russia. Okay, can you explain? Well, it is a matter of energy. It's a matter of uh, military support, in to what extent you are going to do this. It's a matter of, uh, let's say, uh, economical growth being maintained or not. Uh, that's th that are all kind of things that uh, could happen. But I think the fact itself, they will just <coughs> approximately the have the attitude towards Russia that they will step to towards Russia. Okay. Thank you. Also a student who want to provide their answer, or an explanation of their answer. Stay silent. I'm going back. Da, 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 oh, I see a hand raised. Yeah. Thanks you, Hans. <laughs> yes. I would, I would say that they stay unanimous, just because this is for them the quote-unquote first threat in a long time. This ain't Syria for them, this ain't something like Congo that's far away. This is for them close by, so they see it as a threat together. Yeah, so uh, uh, you're saying it's a, a big threat to Europe, I it's close uh, to home, and therefore they, hack they have to act in a unanimous way, is how they feel. Okay, uh, Hans. Uh, I think there are two aspects on this. First is uh, uh, Orban. Orban. Hungary. Or yeah, Hungary. Yeah. Hungary is, of course, uh, trying everything to... <laughs> to save their own billions of euros and subsidies and therefore it's threatening, threatening uh, unanimity. Well, yesterday there was a very interesting report from the director of the uh, Hungarian uh, Central Bank 
And he said, well, we are in a total crisis here in, in, uh, in Hungary because of our economy. And he is an ally of Orban. So if allies of Orban are going to revolt, that's a good sign. For the unity, no? for the unity of, of Europe. Because if I uh, um, explain a little bit, you say uh, at the moment Hungary is the member state within the European Union yeah. that has kind of a different point of view and maybe can uh, also... Yeah. yeah. And normally Hungary is one block with Poland and Slovakia, but that terminated now. Well, What's the difference between uh, the, the uh, po point of view of Poland and Hungary oh in their stand on uh, it, It's totally on different. Ukraine? Can you explain? Uh, well... Uh, Poland is one of, the, of the, the big providers of arms for Ukraine, and the same of Slovakia. So, and they also provide money for Ukraine. Uh, Hungary doesn't do that. So that's, that's an immense difference. So the solidarity in Eastern Europe between these three countries, that's finished. Mm -hmm. Another aspect is rightly pointed out there about the energy. That's the Russian strategy well, make energy so expensive that ordinary people can't afford to heat their houses, and then you have some kind of political uproar in several countries, and then the unity of the European uh, Union will, uh, well, will, will be finished. Okay. But that, that has to do with uh, the, the European uh, dependency yeah. Yeah. on uh, gas and oil uh, from Russia. Absolutely. Is that strategy uh, that Russia is providing, is, are they succeeding in that? At the moment, not. But... Uh, you have to uh, take into account that the Ukrainian economy is almost at the point of zero. And every month they need something like three and a half billion dollars support. AU has agreed to 1.5 billion every month, so that's 18 billion for a year. Okay, uh, we, we will see if, well, if, if, if this uh, is going to be uh, concluded and if not uh, people say, okay, this we, we will not do this because these, these enormous sums, imagine even in our Dutch parliament, we have parties who say, no, 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 this is too much, we are not going to do that. We have to think about ourselves. Yes, okay. So and, and what is going to happen? What could be a solution if there is no unity in European uh, policy anymore? Uh, what, what could we do then? How could we act? Well, that's... Uh, this that's well, uh, normally uh, uh, the United States have to <laughs> have to d to, d to drag this this burden, huh? so but hopefully this will not happen. But we y you cannot predict that. It's about how strong uh, how how uh, will we have minus ten or will we have uh, zero in in, U in Western Europe in temperatures. So you you, c you cannot make a forecast about that. That's difficult. Yeah. So it's really depending on the winter also, Yes, of, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any questions from uh, the room? Or I also see a question maybe from the live chat or WhatsApp. Saskia, go ahead. Yes. Uh, there are two questions. The first was, uh, what do you think about the current sanctions for Russia uh, and its influence on the war in Ukraine? Okay, let's start with that term. one. What do you think? What, what um, sanctions are we talking about for people that are uh, not so much oh, uh, invested in the in stock? The there topic? are several uh, against persons, yes. so uh, people uh, who are part of the, the Russian elite, or Russian oligarchs, or military people. Against companies, so you can't trade. You can't trade with Russia, or you get uh, punishment. Uh, but also about technology. For instance, Russia needs to develop new oil fields in the north of the country, okay. in the Barents Sea, but uh, they need technology who, uh, which is coming from Norway. Okay. Nor yeah. But Norway is refusing that. And what is their influence? The, the question that, that came from No, uh, that from there the are more of them. Four is, and that's very important, Russian assets in the West are frozen. That's more than $320 billion dollars. And the Russian state can't use that. And now the discussion is, are we going to use that for uh, rebuilding Ukraine, of course? So there are all kinds of sanctions. Russia is the most sanctioned, san <coughs> most sanctioned country in human history at this moment. Of course that has an influence. But sanctions, okay, if we sanction now, then the effect is a year later, half a year later. Okay. But it takes time. Yeah, yeah, it takes time. It takes time. The influence. Yes. Okay. 
The other question, uh, Saskia. It's a long one, so I'll read it out l loud. Uh, the question lets, if the European Union continues to do nothing, mm -hmm. uh, will we get to the same situation as the Second World War when the where World War where Europe was said to Hitler, let, them, let him keep his conquered land, it will keep him happy. Then Hitler went on invading more countries anyway. Who says Putin won't do the same? Uh, shouldn't we then, when we look back on history, intervene now? Yeah, but the uh, question is clear. Yeah, the question yeah? is okay, clear. Good. Yeah, but uh, I don't think uh, the comparison is is right uh, because uh, the European Union is actually arming Ukraine, is financing Ukraine. You're saying we're not doing nothing. No, 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 ab Union. absolutely not. Okay. We are training yeah. Ukrainian military in Spain, in the Netherlands, in Britain, in Germany. So uh, the only question is what kind of, what type of arms will we deliver to Ukraine? And you see some kind of a, a transformation. In the beginning there was only talk about defensive weaponry and now there is also offensive weaponry. For instance, the, the Caesar's cannons, Caesar's guns of the French army who are delivered uh, to the Ukrainians, excellent weaponry. Okay. And very offensive. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Hans. Um, I hope that answered the question. I'm looking around if there are any more questions from the room. I see a hand. I'm coming to you with the mic. Uh, did the West uh, made any mistakes after uh, uh, the end of the uh, the Cold War towards Russia? And there you. Yeah. So did the West make any mistakes? I, I need two hours for that. Okay. <laughs> Hans, I, I give you one minute, so... Uh um, well, we, we, we made one, one big mistake, and that's, I think, it's about uh, expansion of NATO. What happened there what was What is NATO, for people uh, who might uh, not be... Uh that is the, the, we the Western alliance, uh, yeah. the military alliance. Um, uh, Secretary Baker promised in the 90s that NATO would not expand, uh, not have an expansion, uh, but then Germany would unite. That would be the deal. On the one hand, unification of Germany, on the other hand, no expansion of NATO. Yeah, and then you mean no new member states that are close Exa to the Russian exactly. border? Exactly. Yeah. I thought, uh, and I, I once had a lunch with the Russian ambassador, and I told him, okay, if that's true, Show me, this, show me this treaty. Now, there is no treaty, it's, it's only verbal things, huh? promises. But then a student of mine went to Washington and made a research in American archives. And he found really clues about this. So I believe the Russian side here that this was promised. Well, that's a failure. That's a mistake. Yeah. And there are more of them, but that's in the economic field. And uh, what was the reaction of, of Russia now that y you say that, that promise well, was made? And well, now this is always, of course, mentioned by Russians. But yes. you can say, okay, but you uh, undersigned the Budapest Memorandum in 1994, uh, where Ukraine said, okay, we will uh, put our uh, nuclear arms in Russia, and we will, uh, but Ukrainian territory is guaranteed. So basically, uh, now yeah, the Ukrainian uh, government has a point. If they s tell tell us, uh, well, that that, that uh, Budapest Memorandum of 1994, that's the basis of everything, and not a, it's not about expansion of NATO. Okay. Yeah. Ah. Thank you. So th that uh, mistake was uh, was explained. Thank you for the question. Um, we're moving on. There's one more scenario where we would like to have your input on. So one last time, please uh, get your phone out. And this one is about uh, Putin himself. Um, the scenario reads, within a year, Putin will be out of power and this will help to end the war in Ukraine and improve the relation between Russia and Europe. First is, um, so first, do we believe Putin will be out of power, maybe overthrown from within Russia? And secondly, if he's out of power, will this help to improve the relation between Russia and Europe? I see that uh, most of us think this is a very unlikely scenario to happen.
who thinks this is very unlikely to happen, who voted for yes, this is unlikely to happen. Can I see hands? Yeah. Can I ask you uh, why do you think this is unlikely? Um, I haven't spoken English in a while, so uh, I'll try my best. Um, oh, uh, you can also do it in Dutch if that's more comfortable. Uh, I'll do it in English. Um, what I think will happen is that um, there's not enough incentive in Russia to overthrow Putin. I think the top layer is pretty secured. Uh, so I think it'll just be incremental deaths and everything. It, it, I, don't, I don't think it will be anything fast. I don't think it will happen in the next couple of years. I think this will drag on for way too long. Too many people will die. And uh, the, the solution is not certain for me like i'm not sure how this will end up but i don't i don't think it'll be fast it'll take okay very clear and you your english is perfect so don't worry is there also someone who, who thinks this, this is c could be a likely uh, event to happen putin being out of power yes i see you in the back okay i'm coming to you again please share yeah, that's super funny i'm again uh, in a very opposite uh, opinion right side but um, I'm, um, I'm a little bit surprised, and it's just something that I also want the, the audience to maybe have a thought about, how we want it to be. And then we think, okay, if I want it this way, then this and that resources are required, and then this is the aim, and we're going for it. And this is a little bit of, a, I believe, a mode I'm finding myself, and if I believe a lot of Ukrainians are, which still gives U Ukraine, uh, um, you know, uh, a power and uh, faith uh, to keep going because uh, we are not only losing money, you know, we are. It's a, it's a lot more. So um, I'm a little bit like it's it's a little bit weird for me to see that so many people are so not. Uh, you know, enthusiastic. Maybe you uh, you 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 see it as like realistic way, but isn't realistic uh, is when you think of how it should be, and then you plan accordingly and you act accordingly. Yeah, thank you for that answer. Yeah, so so you say uh, uh, what you hope, and then see what's needed, and then put a plan into action to make it happen. Thank you. Yeah, one more uh, comment from the room, and then we go to Hans. Yes, please go ahead. So, in my opinion, this statement exists of two different things. You're right. Firstly, you know, if Putin would be out of power, that would be great, obviously. Um, but in my opinion, the question is, sh when Putin leaves his position, or when he dies, or whatever, um, wouldn't it be the case that, you know, someone with the same thoughts would take over his position? And then, in that case, I would say, it's very unlikely to happen that the situation will change, even though Putin will be gone. Yeah. Like to know yeah, yeah. So actually, that's also the question we're going to uh, right now. So um, the question, let's say Putin will be out of power, of, um, a, I don't know, of a disease, of he's overthrown. Yeah. Would that make any difference? Mm. At the moment, um, I fear that I have to be pessimistic. What will happen then is probably some kind of person like Patrushev. Patrushev, who's that? Uh, who's, who's the boss of the FSB, the, the, the Russian um, security service. And he's more hawkish than Putin. Even more? Even more. So that's, that's one uh, part of the answer. It's not for sure that if Putin is gone, that someone more liberal will come to power. I don't think so at the moment. And the other thing is, and that, that uh, I, I made this remark earlier, um, our thinking, our Western thinking, is not popular in Russia at the moment. So, uh, but for that, will uh, if, if there is a necessity for better relations between uh, Russia and the West, if, that's, if this necessity is there, there should be also a basis, a sort of pro-Western basis in Russia which is not there, simply not at the moment, because of 20 years of propaganda. Yeah. Is it gone that people um, who were maybe anti-Putin or anti-regime? Of course, a lot of people have fled Russia. 700,000 uh, have, in the latest months, 
uh, left Russia for Kazakhstan or Georgia or other countries. So that's really, uh, th and of course these were pro-Western, for not for main part, for an important part. So th that's rather difficult. There is no common ground between Russia and the West, and that's the problem. Okay, I think that's a very clear answer. And uh, Hans, uh, with that, I want to thank you for now. Uh, please stay seated, uh, because <laughs> if we go to our, our, our next uh, guest, um, <laughs> this is it's not our next guest. guest. No. <laughs> <laughs> we did not invite him. But um, our next uh, guest speaker is uh, Fleur Ravensberger. And Fleur is uh, joining us uh, online. So I hope that now, magically, she's not there yet, Rens. Okay, Fleur, are you there with us? Yes. I'm here. Okay. Uh, we can hear you. Can you also hear us? I can hear you. Okay. Loud and clear. Okay. Is it also loud and clear for everyone in the room? Can we hear Fleur? Okay. Uh, Fleur, thank you so much that you're uh, you're joining us today. Uh, you came right uh, from from another meeting into this meeting, but uh, we're happy that you made it and you're here with us today. Um, I'll introduce Me you and, and tell uh, the audience more about uh, uh, who you are and, and what you do uh, for a living. Um, Fleur is an uh, international peace negotiator and uh, the co-founder of the uh, Dialogue Advisory Group. And uh, for her work, uh, this means she actually has a track record in peace negotiations during armed conflict. Is that kind of a good summary, Fleur? <laughs> yes, that sounds about right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, that also uh, kinds of uh, bring me uh, of brings me to uh, a next question to uh, the audience. Uh, uh, you're on a, a positive note, and uh, I also want to bring you on a positive note. Uh, it's an open question for uh, menti.com, and this question is related to the topics that we're speaking about today. Um, what is your hope for the future if we are discussing the themes that we are discussing today? So the situation in Russia, Europe, the situation in Ukraine. What is your hope for the future? You're asking, is this a question to me or is this No, it's, the it's uh, for the, the, the audience in the room. So they're now right. answering okay. this question uh, on menti.com. And I will read Thanks. out uh, the answers. <coughs> Okay, I see one answer so far, that the Russian military power will implode, that they will be forced to ask for a truce, which subsequently will lead to an unfavorable peace. Uh, world peace, I see, very clear answer. There will be peace and prosperity for Ukraine and Russia. Societies with more trust towards each other. This is also, uh, I think, a beautiful one, that more and more Russian troops refuse to fight society understand the meaningless of this war. Russians standing up against the regime. No more civil and military deaths for both Ukraine and Russia. Okay see more uh, kind of the same answers coming in so it's about trust it's about ending the war <coughs> that Russia will be defeated and will have to rebuild itself as a d democracy okay uh, I'm going to ask the uh, the same question to Hans uh, on a positive note what is your hope for the future yeah, but, uh, uh, sorry for the positive but I think about the words of list trust Thus, the former uh, English uh, Prime Minister, mm -hmm. Ukraine can win, Ukraine must win, Ukraine will win. And then we can talk about peace. Thank you. <laughs> Is there someone who wants to, uh, to explain their answer that they put in this chat? You can raise your hand. Yes, I see someone from the back. I mean here, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I answered about uh, the troops which will refuse uh, to 
fight because uh, there are more and more such cases and I hope that there will be more maybe after this difficult winter because uh, the Russian army has uh, poor supply and everything. So I hope that the moral uh, of Russian troops will be <laughs> on the zero level and uh, something will happen, something will move to the best. Thank you. So you hope more Russians uh, in, the, in the army will refuse to, to fight. Okay. Looking around, any other input? Saskia, someone from the chat maybe? Uh, well, previous there was the remark, the only future for the Russian people is to defederalize Russia. I can't uh, hear you. Can you uh, ah. say it again? Uh, it was a previous remark, but it's accurate. I think the only future for the Russian people is to defederalize Russia. So maybe someone can comment on that. You what want to rea mean? react to that, Hans? Uh, then, then we need two hours. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to do that. Okay. Then I look around again, if, if there are anyone who wants to, uh, to react to this. And if not, that's also okay. Then we're, we're moving on. Um, for this part, then, uh, I want to thank uh, you, Fleur, uh, for joining us today, um, for your uh, valuable input and um, also for, for your positive remarks. Also, Hans, uh, a big thanks to you. And um, for uh, the last part, uh, I would like to invite um, Mirte uh, Nauta to uh, the stage. And um, we asked her, she's a, a spoken word artist. She also works for Free Press Unlimited. And we asked her to do a live performance about the future of young people who are impacted by um, the situation, the conflict in uh, Ukraine. So uh, over to you, Mirte. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Am I audible? Hello. Yes. <laughs> What to do when your whole future is blocked from view? Invisible through a tunnel collapsing? You want to look forward, look ahead to see what it holds for you. But it's bleak and blurry. You rub the grit from your eyes to help you see, but it's salt from tears. You didn't know you were crying. Crying for the little beauty stomped upon by the big ugly face of war. Carefree laughter turned to screams, family gatherings with empty seats, dinners interrupted by sirens, playgrounds that are too silent. What the hell happened here, you think? How did it all turn to ashes so suddenly? When did life come to be so razor sharp? Scraping your edges, cutting your periphery, slicing your opportunities into tiny little pieces. You don't know what to do. You can't see anymore how to become you. All because of a small man with little heart and narrow mind. A man who no longer can put peace over power and heart over hate. If his deeds weren't so horrendous, I would feel pity. For what a poor life you lead when you make others bleed for your greed. One of the worst crimes is to imprison someone's mind. Put barricades around words, rules on what you can and cannot see. Force people to believe in one side of a story. Carefully curated. Woven together with lies and deceit. Planting seeds that grow hate for a manufactured enemy. Thousands of young men. Boys even. Forced to fight their neighbors. Their equals. With similar hopes and dreams. Firing bullets that kill futures of those that lose and those that take a life. There are no winners here. No victory, just fear, losses on each side. What to do? When the future you thought you had, you did not doubt for a second, was waiting for you, is shoved off the table. Scattered throughout the room. You look around at what once was and see it doesn't fit you anymore. So you pick up the pieces that you could still use, put them in a bag, leave, and don't look back. See if you can rearrange those pieces somewhere else into a new, shimmering, mosaic life, of which you can tell it was broken, but it's still beautiful. 
A shattered life is still alive, a bruised heart still beats, and a shaded future can still shine bright. Everything's uncertain, but you're here. You don't know a thing, but you're here. Not a single guarantee, but that you're here. Your presence is power. Grasp it. Stand firmly and hold your ground. Keep it, walk surely and don't look down. It is yours. Plant seeds of little beauty. Make it grow at set, set root. In this unexpected life that was handed to you, Rebuild a tunnel that leads to light, then rub your eyes and it becomes clear again. This time you see it was never the end. You look up and see a watery sun rising. You can begin again. What if your future is your present? What if your future is here today? What if your future is the next step you take, the next mistake you'll make, the next glass you'll raise for all time's sake? Here's to you. And all you've seen, here's to building a new dream, here's to all that's in the past, here's to everything that didn't last, here's to all you had to let go of, here's to holding on to love, here's to everything you feel, here's to tears, here's to fears, here's to knowing you will heal, here's to pain, here's to strain, here's to making one last vow, the future's here, here's to now. Thank you. Thank you, Myrthe. I think uh, that touched uh, a lot of us. Thank you for these uh, beautiful uh, words. And that's also uh, the end of this program here in the room. Um, I also would like an applause for Hans. We didn't do that yet. <laughs> and for Fleur, who's still with us online. <coughs> and I uh, really um, would also like uh, an applause for the technical team. Joska and Rens. And what I would like to do now is, um, I would really uh, love it if you're not going right out now, home, uh, other things that you have to do today. I think um, we haven't ended together, right? So um, I would like to invite you to have a cup of tea with us, uh, a little snack, and to have a conversation of everything that has been said here today. Uh, maybe to ask a question uh, to Hans or Meerte or myself, or to discuss with, with your neighbor what you heard today or what you learned. And um, yeah, I think that's the end. Um, thank you for your presence. And please follow uh, Marie, I think, or Saskia. They will lead you to the tea and the snacks. Thanks. <laughs>